Welcome back to CBIA's webinar on essential skills for supervisors and managers. We're going to move on to our second presentation on how to improve employee retention with effective communication. Our speakers are Jennifer Marecki and Abru Eftelioglu, both from CLA. They have 30 years of HR experience between them. Uh, Jennifer's the Director of HR Consulting and Outsourcing at CLA, and Abru is an HR Senior Generalist. So ladies, welcome and take it away. Thank you, thank you. It's um, a pleasure to be here today. We're excited to talk a little bit about the great resignation, the effects that it's had on all of the employers out there. Um, and then improving uh, retention with communication, some strategies we can hopefully share to help you um, improve that within your business. Um, so just by quick introduction, um, I'm Jen Marecki. I've been with um, CLA for about three years now. Um, I lead the HR consulting and outsourcing team, which is a national team. Um, we are located in Connecticut. Uh, we work with clients all around the U.S. and globally, and we help with any of their HR needs, everything from simple you know, questions that come up to managing their HR as an outsourced option. Abru, you want to give a quick introduction? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Avery Shinolu, and I've been working with CLA for a year now in the West Hartford office as a senior HR generalist. I have a master's degree in human resources and employment relations, and my background is in talent management and employment relations. Um, before I joined CLA, I worked in the oil and gas industry in a manufacturing company and held numerous HR roles, and I'm happy to be here today, and I will be walking you through some of the common challenges that come with confronting the great resignation. So let's go ahead and jump right to it. Now, um, many people hear about the Great Resignation. However, the ones faced with confronting the Great Resignation truly understand how the pandemic has impacted the perception of work. So we will be talking a little bit about that today. And we would also like to add um, to your kit toolkit so that the next time you are confronting the common issues that we all are facing, you can walk away with feeling better equipped to attract and retain talent within your organizations. Looking into the um, learning objectives here. Sorry, I'm having a quick technical issue, but <laughs> as far as the next steps, we will talk about the importance of retention. And with that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Jen. Sure, thanks. So, um, just to kind of start this off, so let's, we'll start with the obvious, March 2020, about two and a half years ago, COVID hit, um, we've all had to adjust, um, really test our adaptability skills, um, learned a lot about ourselves as employers and employees. Um, it was a, re a real true test of adaptability for many businesses, um, you know, adjusting to what went from full-time work to maybe full-time remote work to full-time remote work from a different location. Um, many of our clients had challenges with employees who, who suddenly had children who had to be, you know, home full-time and spouses. We had to share spaces. Um, you know, it really forced us to sort of look at our careers, our jobs, our professions, our businesses in a different view. Um, retention has been something that has become so, so important in this interesting job market. We're going to talk a little bit more in detail as we go through this process, but um, the goal of retention is obviously to really, we need to foster that employee engagement and create a satisfaction for our employees to retain those employees, which allows us to have more um, you know, greater productivity, increased profitability. Um, you know, these challenges are not unique for any one business. Um, we've had many clients who have had to modify and adjust, as I mentioned, you know, all the way across their businesses to make, um, you know, to make for a more productive work environment. So um, what we're hearing our clients say as a result of all of the past you know, few years is the, de the demand for talent has skyrocketed. So talent acquisition has become the most important um, 
you know, differentiator in your business. Um, talent acquisition is becoming more and more competitive with fewer people out there looking and applying for jobs. We have many theories behind why that's happening. There's plenty of statistics um, based on the conversations we're having. This initially started with the hospitality and healthcare um, and education areas. Those industries were certainly hardest hit. But as this has evolved and continued to, to you know, significantly, significantly impact businesses, we're seeing it everywhere. Um, it doesn't some, come as a surprise that everyone is really feeling this. We've seen statistics uh, as uh, such as 94% of retail establishments have some level of unfilled roles. Um, you'll see business businesses with help wanted signs in you know in windows um, every time you walk up and down the streets. You see restaurants who have had to adjust their hours because they can't fully staff their um, you know their their business, and so they will downsize the number of tables they have. Um, you know they're adapting. They're adapting to this. One of the um, one of the most interesting. Um, comments, I guess, is that as you see on the slide, there has been a shortage of workers prior to the pandemic. And now with the great resignation or the great reshuffle, um, we're seeing this really impact and make it more and more challenging for all businesses. So 60% of Americans are considering or did change jobs over the past two to two and a half years. The pandemic forced some of that change, we know that. But what was driving that was the way people were looking at this. So life is short. People are looking at their lifestyle and saying, is this how I wanna work? Do I wanna get up every morning and fight traffic and go to an office or a, you know, a business um, environment that doesn't allow me flexibility? Do I wanna work at home? Um, you know, is that a better fit for me at this point? There was a time where we really had no choices. Um, things were different. Employers required people to be physically in their, um, you know, in their offices. That's adjusting. Um, after today's session, we're hoping that we have a better ability to look at um, how, how we can flex. What can we do to um, and, you know, attract better um, options and what if uh, flexible with certain opportunities, although we know some of them we can't be. Um, and then last, what if I changed to a better job? That's one of the leading um, questions that we hear people are asking. What if I moved to something that fit me better? So I think we can move on to the next slide. Abru, you want to jump in and talk about the, the drivers? Sure. So when we look into the drivers and when we try to assess what the top reasons for resignation may be, what we did was basically looked into um, a recent study that was conducted by the Pew Research Center. And as we do this, I do want to get your perspective as well. So feel free to enter in your comments and we will go over the top reasons for resignation. So the one thing that did come up is that um, the fact that some employers had decided to shift towards a mandated COVID vaccine policy and to see how much impact this had on um, employees and on resignation. Looking into that, I just want to see what the guesses may be and how that was um, rated amongst the top reasons. So according to the peer research, uh, peer research numbers, 8% of the respondents said that the employer COVID vaccine mandate was the top reason for their resignation. Another um, factor that came into play was whether or not the employees felt disrespected in the workplace. Just gonna give you a few seconds to see what your perception here is. So this was rather high. 35% of the respondents said that the reason they left their position was that they felt disrespected in the workplace. 
a major category had to do with, and again, it was on the spotlight during the pandemic, and it continues to be one today, is health and pay time off benefits that is offered through the organization. And with that, 23% of respondents brought up the fact that this was the reason why they were choosing to go elsewhere. Another major category, and we hear this quite often, this is a, a motivational factor for many, but not the only one, and that is to pay. So out of all the respondents, 37% of them mentioned that they decided to leave their organization due to low pay. I personally was kind of surprised that um, pay was again high, but high up there with the fact that they did feel disrespected. And that was one of the main reasons for top resignation. An important thing for a lot of individuals is to see if there are opportunities within the organization, if they have opportunities to learn, to develop and to advance. And from the respondents, 33% of them mentioned that the lack of advancement opportunities was one of the reasons why they decided to leave the organization. Work-life balance, we hear this quite often and that ties into working too many hours, that ties into perhaps not having a general understanding of what the organizational policy may be and looking into the statistics, 20% of the respondents mentioned that they chose to leave an organization due to the long hours that they had spent as well as not having that work flexibility that they were looking for, where you see 24% of employees resign as a result. Now, Looking into the statistics, what we do say if we were to rank them is that low pay is on the top of the list. And then you see a common theme here and you see that feeling disrespected, not having advancement opportunities and not seeing that work-life flexibility is very close to the top along with low pay. Then comes health and pay time benefits as well as working too many hours. And to our surprise, the fact that there might be a COVID vaccination mandate in place did not factor in too much in regards to how it played out for the top reasons of resignation. So we're gonna do a quick poll here. And I'm interested to hear your perspective and see what the top reasons for resignation for you, for your organization may be. So let's take a minute here and run that poll questions if we could please learn. Okay, great. So I'm going to launch the poll now. So all of you should be able to see the question, what are the top three reasons for resignation? Go ahead and submit your answer. We'll give you about 30 seconds to do so. And then we'll take a look at the results. Thanks, I see lots of responses coming in. It's pretty similar and aligned with what the Pew, a Pew Research Center is telling us. And um, what I do wanna point out here is that if you do subscribe to the belief that pay is key, pay is very important, we're not taking away from the fact that it is, but you still run the chance of um, some people resigning for the next three reasons. And what they are here, as we see in this slide, is that the common theme that we are noticing is feeling disrespected, no advancement opportunities or very limited growth and advancement opportunities, as well as limited work hour flexibility are also what the employees are pointing out as the top reasons for resignations. And what these do have in common is that they are factors that require attention and interaction and connection, and there's something that can be done about it. So with the pandemic, as we've noticed, there had been a sudden shift, the management shifted its focus from basically trying to find ways to stay afloat. But now is a great opportunity in the time that we see as a way to transition into a mindset that talks more so about how are we going to shift from 
a manager leader mindset and looking into um, the challenges, the myths, and the tips that come along with that. So becoming a manager basically is not doing things differently, but it's also requiring us to think differently. And in order to set up ourselves for success, there is a need to shift our mindset from just being an individual contributor to a manager and a leader. And as we are um, looking through a different lens, there are going to be challenges. There will be change and change does not come easy for many. So in our mind, we do have ingrained thoughts and patterns. We talked about biases that we have in the previous section, as well as some habits that we do bring to the table too, which are and could be our core values and beliefs. And these are all very um, powerful drivers of our behaviors and how we see the world. So until we adjust our mindset, we're going to be constantly battling what comes instinctively to us. And as we look into um, further details of management and leadership, Inevitably, the word followership comes to mind. So followership is basically has several nuances to it. So is it about how people follow you or is it about bringing the best out of others and a way for managers and leaders to develop future leaders? So what is it exciting to you about being a manager and a leader? I would recommend everyone to think this question through as you sit here within a capacity in your organization as a manager and a leader, what is it about you? Is it the authority or is it the opportunity that it gives you to build people? And it is a call from evolving into focusing on building people is how I see it. And as you move into this role, it is a way for you to establish a philosophy a style without sacrificing who you are or also your own authenticity. And as we'll see shortly, authenticity is key as an attribute of successful leadership. We look into the focus on the day-to-day of management and leadership and allocating the limited resources that you have in how to manage and it is hard to do. So it requires doing a self-check on a regular basis communication, communication, and communication. We cannot highlight that enough. Communication is key and it matters um, a lot more. It's important to be able to be clear on your expectations, to be clear on your priorities as you set them, and regularly be able to remind your team as to what those overarching purposes may be. And it's also, a way for us to look into the common values and the common standards of the team. So basically, you as a manager are there to be able to set the tone for the organization, for the team. As you do so, being vulnerable, taking risks is expected. It's human nature and it will happen. So humility here is a good thing. And um, go into this with a um, notion that no one is invincible. And if you're not feeling vulnerable, then you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough or maybe taking risks. And leadership for some can be lonely and it can be full of self-doubt. So it's okay to have self-doubt every once in a while. There are several definitions of leadership out there. I did want to bring in a few. David Foster Wallace is one that defines leadership as individuals who can overcome their own selfishness weakness and fears and get to the point where they have us work harder, do better and do more important work where we would otherwise not be able to do so on our own. And there is the age old question about leadership on our leaders made or our leaders born. And Nancy Cohen tells us that leaders can be made. So with that in mind, we will jump to the several myths myths that we see with leadership. 
And as we talk about these challenges that a new manager faces, I'm certain that the challenges that you have faced may not be here on this list. So feel free to provide your comments to us as to what those challenges may be. And um, when we looked into what those common new manager challenges were from dozens of dozens of clients that Jen and I have served, we've gathered that these challenges, first of all, are common and they are common across, across different industries as well as um, different geographies. And as you will see, these um, challenges here can be that um, management training is a need to be a great manager, but that can stand as a myth. And it's also about that, it's about people, it's not just about people. So the myth around the fact that management requires um, a lot of attention to manage people can be right and wrong, depending on what the context may be. It's There's a myth around the fact that it's hard to become a manager and it's harder to become a new manager without having the toolkit in place. So we wanna talk about what that may be as well. And the most common thing that I have seen, especially in the manufacturing um, industry, is that some have the technical skills required for the position for the job, but that does not necessarily maybe equate to having the skill sets that would make them a great manager. But these are things that we can absolutely work on and build upon. Yeah, and I would jump in and add, um, <clears throat> you know, I think one of the one of the biggest um, myths or misconceptions perceptions is that um, managers need to go through all of this training. You know, a lot of um, being a manager is embracing your style and helping to communicate and engage with your team. Um, I think one of the the comments on the previous slide about technical skills, um, you know, we don't all have to be perfect at everything that we're doing. We need to know that we have the support and the um, you know, the uh, tools and the understanding of our team. And so if you have someone on your team who might be better, um, as an example, with Excel or, you know, something that you use frequently, but not so much that it really ties you up, um, you know, embrace that and, and have those team members help, help you and help others. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing across the board with this new you know, more remote or more flexible um, environment is that um, engagement piece. And so it's really important as a manager that you figure out how to really engage with your team. Um, you know, you have to know your resources and where to get help. As I mentioned, understanding who has the strengths in, in certain areas. Um, we've worked on for a number of our clients, a skills assessment. So really evaluate your team and know who's, who's strong where, and then embrace that because um, the, biggest, uh, the biggest way to retain people is have them engaged in things they enjoy doing. Um, you know, I, it goes without saying that we wanna make sure that you're checking in on them as part of this process and making sure that they're engaged. Um, it's challenging. It's challenging when people are remote to make sure that, you know, certainly they're on their, you know, nine o'clock Zoom call or their 1230, you know, team meeting, but are they really engaged? Are they actively involved with what they're working on and are they enjoying it? Are they collaborating? So, um, you know, some of these tips um, identify a mentor, find someone that can help you really understand your strengths and roll those out to your team in the most productive and effective way. Um, you know, keep an eye on your staff. We try and do more regular check-ins. Um, we encourage our, our employers to um, set up regular sessions, not just work-related, but you know, fun, do something to make sure that everyone is, is there and involved, um, participating. Um, we've seen things like quick 10 minute check-ins with the entire team, go around the room just for a quick minute, have everyone throw out a, a topic or an interest that you can, you know, put on the agenda for the next meeting. Again, keep them actively involved. Um, set your expectations, as Abru mentioned earlier, it's all about communication and it's challenging now to communicate this information and you need to be upfront. You need to be very clear. 
um, you know, I try to, I try to um, clarify that this has to be communicated verbally in a meeting. And then again, with a follow up in an email, um, especially in the environments where you are remote or, or people are in more flexible schedules, so they may not all be in that place at the same time. Um, you know, establish your boundaries, use your calendar wisely. As managers, I find right now, especially that I'm hearing a lot of people really feeling burned out. Um, it is challenging to do, you know, we always talk about you do your job and then the managing job. Um, that can be difficult. So make sure you set your time on your calendar very clearly to block out time for you to do your work and then for you to be available for your teams. Um, you know, I try and set aside a little bit of time every week to make sure that if I have someone I'm concerned about, that I connect with them. Um, and I think that that's something that we encourage our our clients to do as well. Um, collaborate. Obviously, that is really so important in engaging people. Make sure you're collaborating. And more importantly, make sure your teams are collaborating. Don't, don't assume that just because you're leading projects or you're leading meetings or you know that they're working on their different assignments, that they're collaborating. Encourage them to collaborate. Make sure they're setting up that time. Um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, find your style and try to be flexible because your style may not work for everybody and vice versa. Um, but try and figure out a way to make it work. Um, I know I, I've seen a few managers who are really challenged by having teams that all have different styles too. And so how do they embrace that and how do they get those teams involved and um, support them on, on a way that makes every everyone happy? It's challenging, but but work at it a little and try and figure out a way that would work. Don't be too hard on yourself. And of course, have fun. It's, it's an interesting time for sure, but there are a lot of great ways out there to make these things work. So we want to work on, or we want to talk, I'm sorry, next about the pandemic's impact on the perception of work. Um, and, you know, we, we covered this a little bit, but so there's Really, on the next slide, we're going to roll into the employers. So the employer's perception is that we are already struggling for staff prior to this. There's been a labor shortage for, you know, for a very long time now. Um, location of work changed for many of us. Um, you know, again, we talked about remote. We talked about condensed hours, expanded hours. Um, adaptability has been interesting. Communication has been impacted. And for many of us, we went from having everyone in the office from nine to five to now remote. And so how do we work this? You know, is, is a once a day check-in enough? Is a once a week check-in enough? Um, we have struggles with pay competition. Um, we, have, we have learned very quickly that traditional recruiting is not going to work for every environment. We have to figure out how to do that better. Um, and then looking for solutions. From the employee's perspective, we're, you know, we're seeing a lot of people step back from work. It's an applicant's market. The jobs are everywhere. Um, we, we find a lot of people do want to work from home. A, a lot of people really just want flexibility. Um, we, want, we, we find that they are connecting less. And again, this goes back to the engagement piece. Retention is so important. Mm -hmm. Um, to all employers and in engaging your teams is the key to that. Um, you know, pay, certainly the employees are feeling as though they want to be paid what they are worth. And that's a challenge because some jobs just don't pay what the individuals want to be paid. Um, and then, you know, getting the attention. So how are these employees getting the attention um, of their employers, of their coworkers, et cetera. So, the, the bottom line is that employee morale has changed. Management has really had to step up. Um, we've, we've really been challenged helping our employers, um, our clients manage how their future of um, business looks. Um, how are they going to navigate this? And how are they going to make sure that they're keeping their staff, that they're keeping them engaged and that they're continuing to attract new um, new talent. So um, I'm going to go ahead and spend a few minutes talking about attraction and retention in today's climate. And when we think about recruitment, let's take a step back here and talk about where recruitment starts. So basically, 
we need to consider what the organizational culture is. And when I say organizational culture, it's thinking about things that the organization is perhaps famous for, what you do better or more creatively, and how do you sell the brand of your organization and the opportunity simply to prospects of candidates. And um, here is the differentiating factor is whether or not you are a commodity and how you're able to basically customize your organizational culture so that you can better communicate this to the um, applicants as it is a very tight market right now. And with the candidates or the applicants, the, the, these factors here are the ones that they will take into consideration on whether or not they would like to move forward with their candidacy. And we talk a lot about from the recruitment side about the candidate experience and it is still everything. And it re directly impacts the retention even in these early stages. So there is no such thing as over communicating here is a time to communicate as much as possible and to keep building that relationship as it is challenging to um, pull together the interview schedules. And it's important to remind the candidates of where you are in the recruitment process and let them know that the details are being worked on and that you are going to get back to them with the next steps. It's important to keep in mind that if you want someone, well, the chances are that someone else wants them too. So that is why we need to understand that recruitment starts with expressing and identifying what the organizational culture may be, keeping in mind what the can experience is from the very first touch, and knowing that, yes, pay is important. It's not the sole factor. It's not the sole driver of um, attracting talent and being accurate, being clear, and establishing yourself in how you're setting up, setting up yourself in the market and how you would like to operate and the speed you would like to operate is important. And that's what recruitment does essentially start with. Now, I want to just add in, before you jump onto that, Abru, I just want to add in another comment. The interviewing session prior to this was great and I think went over a lot of really important pieces. Um, you know, one, one comment I'd add to Abru's um, previous slide is just, you know, engage with the applicants as well, especially if you think that it's someone that really fits. And um, mm -hmm. as you're learning more about them and getting better understanding of, you know, how they're going to fit into your culture, um, ask them the questions. Why are they looking for this job? Are they looking for other jobs? Try and get a sense. Um, one of the challenges that I see across the board with clients is that we unfortunately are slow to hire. And so if you know that that's your environment and you know that this could take a few weeks, um, you know, be upfront with them and make sure that you have a good understanding. I hear time and time again that, you know, these employers have these great interviews and they, you know, they follow up, but sort of stringing the time out, knowing that it's going to take a little while, and then they ultimately lose the applicant. And so, you know, do your best to be engaged with them and involved and just communicate to them consistently so that you can hopefully avoid that. Go Absolutely. Ahead. Excellent point. Thank you. And um, a small disclaimer before we do tackle this slide, I do recognize that several of these talking points may not be applied or achievable with you, but um, these are the key areas that encompass the current job market. So that's why we have them up here. And again, the focus here is that yes, the base pay is important, but there are other factors that do play into attracting talent. And what we are seeing more and more today is that candidates are looking for what the total package is. And they're asking these questions as to um, what they they may be. So it's important to think about where can you make it up? If it's not non-monetary, then um, what other rewards do you have in place? As we do see that more and more the non-monetary rewards are becoming everything. So what can you do better? And also how are the programs that you have in place perhaps 
doesn't have much of a financial burden on the organization and um, may cost next to nothing. But when you look into the return on investment, they have a massive impact directly and they have a direct correlation with retention and recruitment. And when you are at the position to explain an offer, have an open conversation about what that total package is and talk about what your benefits are and what the costs that the company will be taking on if that's the place. Talk about, if applicable, what the mere increase process in place may be. Is there a bonus structure? Is there a company bonus structure or an individual bonus structure in place? If you have one, this is the time to bring that up. Do you have a COLA process? Again, if that's in place, this is something that can be brought up during the recruitment phase and make sure that all of um, everyone that's involved in the selection process also understands how to explain what is being offered outside of basically stating what the base salary may be. So what do candidates see when they apply? How you're getting current employees involved with recruiting is your total package. And internally facing, as you are promoting open positions, do you offer a referral bonus? If so, a lot of communication needs to go into place when you create campaigns around explaining what the referral bonus may be, how that will impact a existing employee and bringing in the mindset that basically and simply recruiting is everyone's job, not just a recruiter's job. And here, what we would like to invite you to do is think about what your competitive advantage is, specifically when you have budget constraints, and you have um, internal equity considerations. When hiring new staff, think about things such as the onboarding program. I uh, know from fact that onboarding is a make or break deal. As you know, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money goes into recruiting. And if you don't get it right with onboarding, then you are risking the retention piece of it. So is your process efficient and does it promote inclusivity? These are the questions that come to mind. We talked a little bit about work-life balance and here, do you have a competitive advantage? If so, what is it? And what do you pride yourself with? It's a great time to bring that up as well as your organizational culture. What is it? What is the mission, the vision, the values that drive the organization? And we hear oftentimes what climbing the corporate ladder may look like. And um, do you have growth opportunities within the organization? Is this a differentiating factor that you can't bring up during the recruitment process? Is there any innovative technology solution that you have? This is the time to start bragging about them, start talking about the professional development and academic opportunities that you may have. Maybe you have a program in place that's um, called or um, related to tuition reimbursement. So here is an opportunity to define them clearly when engaging with candidates and also a way for you to gauge whether or not they're interested in growth and what their professional aspirations may be. What type of wellness programs are there? If so, what makes them special? And these are the things that tug at the candidates' heartstrings and get them engaged with their culture. So it's great to also bring up the future of work and what the workforce goals may be. And this does provide candidates with a mental visual of longevity with your organization. It's important to remember here that as you are recruiting and as you are assessing whether or not the candidate is a culture of fit and a culture of ad, they're doing the very same themselves. So if we were to um, recap the things that we suggest that you keep an eye out and what to listen for as you are um, talking to candidates, things such as work-life balance, benefits, um, whether or not there is a better commute, 
the better or good positive culture are things to keep an eye out, things to listen for as you're engaging in the interview process and sharing and showing them that there is a greater responsibility and opportunity to grow, if any, um, what the hybrid work arrangement may look like, as well as what the flexible schedule is. And a lot of people do enjoy receiving a um, feeling of satisfaction at the end of the day and knowing that they have fulfilled something and have done something to contribute to the organizational um, overall goals. So talking about employee appreciation and what the recognition practices may be for the organization are things to consider and also to ask candidates for as they are considering a position. We talk about retention and retention does start with your existing um, workforce as well. So as you want to retain the talent that you already have, it's keeping your most important resource. And for that reason, rewards and recognition play a great, great role in how you are able to um, booster the recognition program and keep that retention and keep your employees engaged. So understanding also how your employees like being recognized is equally important. I do know some that do appreciate being recognized, perhaps in a town hall setting amongst everyone. And some may prefer to have a more one-on-one -on -one individual touch to it too. So just like every individual has a um, different learning style, they also do have a different recognition style. So getting to know your employees better and to understand how they would like to be recognized is a good way to start. And basically, um, sometimes it could be just a quiet pat on the back. When you look into the referral programs, so what are you doing for your people and how do you turn your entire workforce into a recruiting workforce? How are you engaging them in this process as they go home? How are they sharing the um, organizational culture, the open positions that they may have with their neighbors, with their network. So for this reason, it's important to engage the entire workforce and have everyone recruiting for an open position if and when that is applicable. And as we talk about recognition and going back to that, we know that years of service is critical. So what are you doing to celebrate the years of service of your current staff members, as well as how goals of achievement are being celebrated? And also, how are you doing shout outs when there is um, informal recognition to take place? The other thing I would also like to point out is we talked about interviewing and we know how important it is when you're external facing, but there's also state interviews and these are super critical. And what state interviews allow you to do is to get with those who you cannot afford to lose, those key position holders. And it helps you understand what keeps them motivated and also what can be done better. It gives you insight as to how you can continue to improve to retain talent. Another important factor in this process is when someone decides to leave the organization, do you have exit interviews? If so, keep in mind that these are also super critical and you just lost perhaps a great employee and the reality might be setting in. So how can you use their departure as a tool to keep others is a question that um, we suggest that you ask yourself. And this is an opportunity for you to sit down with them before they depart and basically get real with them. Understand what is going on, what motivated them to leave, and use this internal strategy to perhaps protect others in the department or the organization. Finding ways to invest in your employees, finding ways to invest in your people and their growth and supporting them to learn and to try new things is also a great retention tool. So there are numerous um, online certifications, professional associations, perhaps credentials out there, and um, you don't necessarily need to pay for an MBA for all employees. Maybe for some you will choose to, but there are ways to find employees um, 
employee growth by finding these um, important resources, external or internal, and supporting them in that um, adventure for them. And sometimes when we talk about career paths, most employees basically have no idea what their career path looks like. So helping create a model and a way to show people where they can go and how they can grow is a critical retention tool. And we cannot emphasize the promotion of health and wellness enough. Always find ways to promote health and wellness as this is one of the biggest things employees want to date. And with that, I do wanna thank you for your time. And I'm excited to be kicking back things over to Jen Recky. Thank you. Um, I, the only thing I did want to just add is sort of a reminder about um, shout outs. And Brew mentioned shout outs. Those are those are a great tool, a great um, opportunity for you to recognize your team. They really should come from senior management. There's nothing more impressive than that coming from you know the the top folks down. So um, be sure to do that. And the other comment that I would make is. Um, you know, it, it should go without saying, but the onboarding process is a huge part of engagement. And one of the things we really emphasize with our clients is to make sure that it is a long process. Um, a lot of employers will consider onboarding a, you know, one day, two day training, etc. cetera. Um, we've actually built an onboarding process that lasts three to six months. Um, as a way of really making sure that your employees are engaged. And so check-ins and you know meetings and scheduling and making sure that everyone is getting involved um, is really key to that. So retention is obviously the most important and, and we hope that you take a couple of pieces away from this today and help out with your, uh, with your team. So Diane, I'd like to pass it back over to you. All right, so let's tackle some of the questions that have come in. Um, how about this one? How do you establish a boundary so your team is not coming to you all day long, interrupting like the revolving door, but there's no actual door to close? Yeah, I, I can certainly jump in with an answer on that one. Um, from my own struggles personally, as well as guidance I've given to clients, um, you know, there's a number of ways that I've found really successful. One would be to, you know, we always want to make sure that everyone knows it is an open door policy. We need to, as leadership and managers, be supportive of that. But we also can emphasize to them that there are certain times where we do need to have that boundary. Um, and so, you know, if you put times on your calendar where you are not necessarily open for a pop-in, um, you know, that's a great approach. The other way is the absolute opposite of that, which is an encouraged pop-in, which hopefully would help your team to understand that, um, you know, from one to three, every day, two days a week, whatever the case may be, you're encouraging your team to come to you that time as opposed to just any time. Um, and, I, and I hope that that helps. And I do think that that's one area where I've, I've tried to enforce with my team that, you know, we encourage it and we really want to speak to you and see you. Um, but we also have jobs that we have to get done and it's hard to focus if you have all these, um, you know, all these, um, let's say, uh, resources. So with Teams and Zoom and cell phones and, you know, phones, um, it's very challenging. And you've got all these opportunities for people to reach out to you. So really try and establish a set number of hours where you can be available, or again, where you are absolutely not available. I hope that helps. It does. Um, how about this one? Uh, how do we encourage our company's leadership, which I'm going to throw this in, maybe of a different generation, um, to get with the times? <laughs> well, I'll comment on that. And then, Abru, you probably have mm -hmm. comments. Um, what, you know, that's always going to be a challenge. And I think that um, as a leadership team um, or managers who are trying to educate or, or sort of reevaluate the business and help 
leadership see that. Um, you know, I would say just coming in with some real understanding of where the challenge is and helping leadership to understand that they may not be seeing it from that perspective. And so I think just educating them on the challenges that you're having, the struggles around um, probably, I'm going to assume maybe around engagement, um, you know, maybe more resources, as Avru talked a little bit about today, more trainings, more, you know, more awareness within the team. Avru, do you want to add anything to sure. that? Sure. And I think that like what comes into play here is basically finding the um, explanation as to what the why may be. So as you do have the challenge and it's important to consider the why as you communicate with you know different generations, I would say, and come together to find a solution collectively. So if it's a more collaborative environment, I have found that even though you may have different perspectives with having inclusivity, that will contribute to um, finding a common ground. And you would be surprised to see the um, change that can happen for, with either party when you have a um, open dialogue and where you have that communication channel open where everyone can share their opinions and also perhaps their possible solutions to a common problem. It may be various um, different solutions to one problem and it's important to be able to get together and also have that inclusivity and also to learn from one another in my perspective. Okay. Um, how do you attract candidates when you work in a field? And this example was education. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, hold on one second, with limited flexibility. So you can't offer, there is no telework. There's no flexible hours. <laughs> so how do you, sure, how do you sure. handle that? Well, um, telework and having flexible hours is just one of the factors that will attract candidates, right? So if you are in education where you have set hours, perhaps in manufacturing where you have an assembly line that needs to run and, or a warehouse and things of that nature where you simply don't have the flexibility that others may have, that's when you ask yourself what the organizational culture is. What is the driving mission, the vision, and the values of the organization that will attract someone to work for you, with you, and contribute to the greater good? So it's not just simply, you know, not having this set work schedule, but people do take pride in what they do. That's what I've come to realize. And how well are you communicating what you do and the impact that you may have on a community, on the students, if we're talking about education and what their role is within the um, position that they are looking to um, fill and share with them how they can have an impact and how they can have that sense of satisfaction, the sense of gratitude at the end of the day that will be a motivational factor to them and make them feel that they have done something great and take pride in what they do. And I, I would just add to that, you know, it's, it is certainly challenging and I, unfortunately, neither of us are able to, to, you know, come up with a whole list of people who are out there looking for opportunities. So it's really key to, you know, emphasize how you're standing out from your competitors. What, what is that, you know, what is that piece about you that we, um, you know, we would encourage you to differentiate yourself. Um, and also looking passively for talent, you know, a lot of people forget they, they sit and wait for applicants to come in. Um, I know there's a number of niche, you know, um, boards out there and things like that. And engaging your employees, your current staff to help with that is a, you know, is a great opportunity. Okay. Do you have any advice on dealing with the employee that's never happy? Um, complains often to coworkers, vents loudly about personal problems, complains about management with no solid examples. Uh, can we ask them to leave if they seem to not fit in with the culture? So, yeah, I mean, that's a, I would say that's an employee relations question and um, what I would probably recommend is to sit that person down and have a conversation with them, you know, ask them, are you, are you happy here? Because it doesn't appear you are, you know, um, and have a mm -hmm. real conversation. I mean, I, I, I say this all the time, human resources 
tends to scare people. It tends to scare managers or directors because they aren't comfortable with how to do this. But the reality is we are human. So have a conversation, um, you know, just simply ask the question, is there, is there a, a problem that you are having that we can help with, you know, help us to better understand why you're so unhappy. If you can't give anything specific, you know, engage in a conversation. Sometimes um, I feel as though it's a lot like the harassment training that we probably everyone on this call has been through a couple of times. People just want to be happier in many cases um, and not always. So certainly maybe the answer is I'm just not going to be happy. You know, it's not my intent, but a lot of times people do just want to be happier. So just have that conversation. Maybe something will come out of it that you can help. And if not, then, you know, yeah, certainly it's, it's an honest conversation to say, would it make more sense to part ways? You know, would you be happier going elsewhere? We, if you can't be happy here, then that is a conversation that should be had. Okay. Um, what about, we've heard a lot in the news about quiet quitting. What is what does that mean? And what I know you've you've actually touched on this to some extent, but what would you say is the most effective way to prevent that or address that? Sure, and I, I'll go first, maybe, and then pass over to Jen. But as we hear more and more about quiet quitting, what we're seeing is that this is becoming an employee engagement issue. And to Jen's points that um, she had brought up during the presentation as well is that they um and the quiet quitters tend to do the bare minimum that's required for them within their role and nothing more and they're not feeling engaged they're not feeling that um, sense of belonging with the organization so if you are to find ways to uh, increase engagement then perhaps you can um prevent some of the quiet quitters and have them tackle on more um, responsibilities within the organization and feel more empowered and feel more um, as a contributor rather than just um, doing what's needed for them to do and nothing more. Yeah, and I would I would agree. It's all about engagement. Um, you know, I, I see oftentimes that, especially in the remote world, um, hybrid, flex, whatever the case may be, people are not feeling as though they have relationships. And so it's very easy to quit. Um, you know, and that's where I think that the conversations we've had around engagement are so important. In addition to the onboarding, you know, the extended onboarding period, um, you know, it's really just an extended engagement conversation. And so get them on board, get them moving along, get them, you know, working and collaborating with their teams or their coworkers or their, you know, managers and supervisors, and then continue that on. Um, I, I, I see it, we, we hear it all the time. There are people who log on at the last possible minute, log off at the first possible minute, you know, they're just not engaged. They're not going above and beyond. There's never any raising of their hands to say, you know, oh, I'd like to do this, or I'd like to help with that. So when you see someone who's falling into those categories, um, you know, start to reach out to them more often, try and connect with them a little more and see if there is any chance to get them more engaged. And hopefully you'll be able to avoid that that quiet quitting. Okay, I'll give you one more. Um, this is from someone who says, I run a warehouse out of California and both the federal government and California provided extra COVID payout for citizens. And when you add that to unemployment, it became really hard to find candidates uh, for positions like truck drivers or warehouse employees because they would make more by not working than by working. Um, that may be less true now than now that there's no more pandemic pay and there's no more COVID pay either. Um, but I'll, when that comes up in other ways, is there is there a way to address that? Um, so I'm not sure I understand. So like, let's Sorry. say that there's that through, let's say either unemployment or some other government benefit, someone okay. can just, it's more, it's better for them it's to stay to home. Right. Like what are... Yeah. What, had, what have you found it, uh, specifically during COVID maybe that were the best ways to attract candidates when it, it may have been um, 
more likely that they would want to not work at all. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's a that's a harsh reality. There are just a lot of people out there that it is. And and to your point, it more so a while back, um, it was, you know, more advent advantageous to them to stay home and collect a check sitting on the couch. And and I think we have seen the the um end of that. I think there are a couple states where they do sort of still offer that and that does make it challenging. Um, you know, I think that again, this is all about, um, it's about the individual. So a lot of people are restructuring their world, their personal lives. And they're saying, you know, I'm, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to go to that office every day. So they're working these gig gig jobs. They're working part-time here and there. And they're frankly making their life work and, and in many cases, probably making as much of an income. Um, so probably driving unemployment down as well because they're not collecting unemployment, but they are working and, you know, it skews, it's, it's really leading to what our new, our new world is going to look like. Um, but I, I'd say it's just all about trying to offer something that differentiates you mm -hmm. and um, enticing. Something different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, Jen and Abru, thanks very much. You've given us a lot to think about. I really appreciate it. And again, just a reminder to everyone out there, um, the slides will be available along with the recording. So if you have, if you want to refer back to something we said, you'll be able to do that. And you can contact both of these ladies at CLA. So Thank thanks very much. And Thank you, everyone. With